Welcome to the press conference, everybody. I will hand over to uh, Dr. Caroline McElnay, the Director of Public Health, for the up latest update, and then I'll make a few comments before taking your questions. Dr. McElnay. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister, and kia ora kato katoa. There are 201 new COVID-19 cases in the community being reported today. Of these, 181 are in Auckland, 15 are in Waikato, four are in Northland, and one is in Taranaki, with the remaining five cases announced last night to be included in tomorrow's figures. There is also one case to report in recent returnees in our managed isolation facilities. Further details are in the 1pm statement. We are very aware of the grief and hurt whānau who have recently lost loved ones to COVID-19 are experiencing. This is a serious virus and none of us can afford to underestimate it. If you or your loved ones are being cared for in the community and you feel that your or their condition is deteriorating, please don't leave it to chance that you'll improve. Please reach out as soon as possible or ask someone to do so on your behalf. This is the advice that's given to anyone and everyone who is being cared for in the community with COVID. Hospital care is free and ambulance services are free for those with COVID-19. Our hospitals are ready to help and have robust infection prevention and control measures in place to keep you and your loved ones safe. I just act like to acknowledge that people have died this week and that is tragic for their friends and family. This is a very real reminder that the more people who get COVID-19, sadly, the more deaths we are likely to see. It is a sad reminder that COVID is potentially fatal, and this is particularly true if you're unvaccinated. Just moving to hospitalizations, there are 85 people in hospital with COVID-19, including three who are still being assessed. Of these, 11 are in ICU or high dependency units. The health system in Auckland can cope with these and the forecasted numbers of cases and hospitalisations. And I'd like to reiterate that there are more than 1,700 hospital beds across Auckland and more than 100 ICU beds. Currently, overall hospital occupancy is about 86%, ICU occupancy is around 70% and ventilator occupancy is around 15%. It should be noted that the ICU bed capacity does change daily, depending on need and staffing. We can manage, but it is important that we limit the load on our hospitals. And there are two key actions that all New Zealanders can do to ensure that our health system is able to provide for everybody's health needs. And those two things are get vaccinated and continue to abide by the alert level restrictions. It's also important that anyone who needs care for any reason seeks it. Do not delay. On testing, there continues to be high demand, particularly in Auckland. Yesterday, there were 30,653 tests processed across the motu, with 11,683 swabs taken in Auckland alone. Specifically on Auckland, just an update there, public health staff are continuing to urge anyone with symptoms, no matter how mild, to get a test. The focus is currently on those living in Ranui, Sunnyvale, Kelston, Birkdale, Manirewa and Mangri. People living in those suburbs need to be vigilant and get tested if they're symptomatic. There are 18 community testing centres available for testing across Auckland today. Testing centres at Northcote, Balmoral, Otara and Wiri continue to operate extended hours to increase access to testing in those areas. Public health staff are supporting almost 3,000 people to isolate at home. That's made up of 1,382 cases across 929 households. Uh, just an update on Auckland West Home in Avondale. A second round of testing was carried out on residents and staff yesterday after two residents tested positive for COVID-19. One further resident tested positive yesterday and has been admitted to Auckland City Hospital. Other results from the second test of all other residents and staff received so far are all negative. Turning to the cases in Stratford now, 
One of the six are in Taranaki Base Hospital and is in a stable condition. The five remaining cases are isolating at home. All of these cases are clearly linked and are also linked to the Auckland outbreak. Contact tracing is underway today to determine the movements of the cases and any locations of interest. Five locations of interest, including pharmacies, a hardware shop and a supermarket, have been added to the Ministry's website so far. Uh, so far, there have been five close contacts identified and our investigations still continue to see if there are any additional ones. Uh, just to note that these cases are um, highly likely to explain the recent wastewater detections in the town, and the most recent detect there was reported on Tuesday. And we want to remind anyone in Stratford or any recent visitors to the town with COVID-19 related symptoms, no matter how mild, should get tested. Details of the testing and vaccination centres throughout Taranaki are on the Taranaki District Health Board website. And just on vaccination, as of yesterday, 86% of eligible people in Taranaki had received at least one dose of the vaccine, 73% had received a second dose. For Māori in Taranaki, 73% had at least one dose, 54% have received their second dose. Yesterday, 801 vaccines were administered in the region. Um, this is a really good time to get vaccinated if you haven't yet done so. On Waikato, there were 15 new cases confirmed in the Waikato overnight. Four cases have been linked um, to previous cases so far. The remainder of the cases notified um, investigations are underway. Uh, locations of interest again are in on the Ministry of Health uh, website and yesterday they were identified in Hamilton and Ultrahanga. There are seven pop-up and dedicated testing sites across the Waikato today. Hamilton, Ngāreo Wahia, Huntley, Ultrahanga, Te Awamutu and Te Kuriti. Yesterday in Waikato there were 3,377 uh, tests processed and 2,628 doses of vaccine given. Uh, in addition, um, uh, COVID was detected in a wastewater sample collected from Taupo on the 8th of November. A repeat sample was taken on the 10th of no November and we expect those results later today. And as we've seen in Stratford, this can be an indication of a case in the community. It can also be due to uh, recovered cases who may be there. But we encourage anyone in Taupo with symptoms, even if they are mild, and regardless of vaccination status, to get tested. On Northland, there are four new cases in Northland being reported today. That brings the total to 39. Three of those new cases are known close contacts of existing cases. That leaves one who is still being investigated and interviewed. Uh, just a note that a person who was previously under investigation yesterday after returning an initial positive result has been reclassified as not a case after being confirmed with um, repeat negative results. In Northland, there continues to be a good turnout for testing, 985 swabs taken yesterday. There were also 1,276 people vaccinated in Northland yesterday. And details of testing and vaccination centres can be found on the Northland DHB website. And just um, finally, um, we are hearing reports that health professionals are being put under considerable pressure to provide vaccine exemptions when the process is just getting underway. Just want to reiterate that there is a single national process with strict criteria, and this is the only process that can be used. So please be patient and be kind to frontline staff. The application process and the criteria under which you can apply is on the Ministry of Health website. The next step of our process uh, is just to confirm the panel members, which we will expect to do in the next couple of days. Back to you, Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Dr McElnay. Uh, you will have seen yesterday that we hit 90% of eligible New Zealanders having had their first dose of the vaccine and 80% fully vaccinated. This is an incredible milestone, and I want to thank the millions of New Zealanders who have taken up the opportunity to get vaccinated. On a DHB basis, six of our DHBs have now hit the 90% mark for first doses. Auckland, Waitamata, Counties Manukau, Capital Coast, Canterbury and Southern. 
Some others are very close to hitting that milestone. South Canterbury is 842 doses away. Hutt Valley is just 542 doses away. This weekend, people in those areas could go and get vaccinated and push their DHB past that 90% milestone. And indeed, right across New Zealand, this weekend is a great time for people to get vaccinated and protect themselves, their family and their community. On the topic of vaccinations, the requirement to be vaccinated for our health and education workforces starts next week. I want to thank the vast bulk of health and education workers who have already been vaccinated. Cabinet has only chosen to require vaccination of workers in the highest risk settings, and this is not a decision that we took lightly. Under 12-year-olds can't be vaccinated yet, but they can get COVID. In fact, about 20% of the cases in the Delta outbreak have been children aged under 12, including babies. So this is one of the reasons we're asking health and education workers to be vaccinated, to protect those who can't yet protect themselves. We've also seen that when COVID gets into school and education environments around the world, that it can spread quickly and easily. For health workers, it's a similar equation. People entering our hospitals, GP clinics and other healthcare settings often have compromised health already. As we've seen in this outbreak, our hospitals and healthcare settings have become some of the key places that COVID is seeding and spreading. Having health workers vaccinated means that those who are sick can have that extra layer of protection from the virus. So getting vaccinated is not only about protecting yourself, it is also about looking out for those around you and those you come into contact with, especially our children and the sick. Vaccine requirements have been commonly used overseas. They work and they're a key part of the vaccination drive in those countries with high rates of vaccination that we're trying to match. Just a quick word on vaccine certificates. As you all know, vaccine certificates are in our very near future. And so far, 700,000 New Zealanders have signed up to my COVID record to create an account. This is where that vaccine certificate will land shortly. So if you haven't already signed up, I encourage you to get cracking today at mycovidrecord.health.nz. And finally, just before we finish up, I'd like to remind everyone that the new resurgent support payment is open for applications. This is now a double payment calculated weekly, but paid fortnightly, the payment being at a rate of $3,000 and $800 per FTE, up to a maximum of $43,000 per business. The wage subsidy also continues to be available to eligible businesses on a fortnightly basis as well. Since the current outbreak began, we have paid out $5.5 billion in economic support via the wage subsidy scheme and the resurgent support payment, which has helped to keep New Zealanders in work. Happy to take your questions. Can we details about the Stratford case? So were any of the cases vaccinated? I believe one of the six mm. were vaccinated, yes. the other five were not. Why did they travel to Auckland in the end of October? So there was a member of the family in Auckland and uh, they were uh, coming down to be with their family in the Stratford area and a member of the family went to Auckland to pick the person up. I, I was going to say, I'm not going to go into the details because I do want to try and um, uh, protect some of the family's privacy here. But yes, it was part of a process of bringing someone down. Why were they reluctant to get tested? I don't have specific information about that as to why they were reluctant to get tested. Um, obviously, uh, they were in touch with the healthcare system over the last um, week or so. Uh, and through that period of time, I am aware that they were asked to be tested, um, but they uh, declined that. Uh, however, obviously, as um, they became or member of the family became more unwell, um, that uh, resistance dropped away. Any of them scanning in? No. You've just been told that there was several hours delay between the DHB finding out and them telling the Ministry of Health and then obviously the public. Is that true? Uh, I'm not aware of that. Mm. Uh, we were first alerted at the Ministry of Health um, yesterday evening. I'm not aware of that either. Told, they, were, they were told uh, early afternoon yesterday, is that true? Mm. Um, I'll fo I can follow that up, but the first that, that we at the Ministry were aware was in the evening. Um, and will you put uh, Taranaki in level three, considering the DHB says at least one case has been infectious for two weeks and in the community, plus that region has very low vax rates? Yes, yeah, so uh, at this time, the advice is not to do that, uh, but 
Dr. McElnay and her public health team are doing ongoing assessments of the situation. The reason for the position we have right now is that we know how the case came to be in, in, or how the virus came to be in Stratford. We know that it is currently confined to one family and one household. But as the day goes on, more interviews are undertaken, more investigations are done, and the public health team would update their uh, information. But if you think about what happened in Christchurch at the beginning of October, similar situation there where somebody was there, uh, we knew how they'd got the virus, we knew how the virus had gone there, and we knew enough about them to be able to say, we think this can be contained. So for now, we're working on that basis, but we continue to listen to the advice that we get. Robertson, are you... I'll just finish with Jess and then come over there. A oh, family um, of a man who died said, are saying that the level of support that they received while in home isolation was substandard, to say the least. Does it upset you to hear that that care was inadequate? Oh, we want to make sure that everybody who is in the community is feeling safe and well looked after, that they know that if there are any issues whatsoever that they can be picked up quickly. The system that we've set up is designed to make sure that we do early assessments on both the medical, the health conditions, but also the public health elements of, of them being safe and able to, to be cared for in the community. Uh, by and large, I believe the system is working well, but clearly there are some examples that are coming through where we do need to tweak the system. That is happening, and we want to make sure that we continue to provide the services that are most appropriate for people. Uh, not the standardised way of interacting might not be the right thing for everybody, and we've got to be able to make sure our systems keep up with that. What are you actually doing to improve the home isolation system so it isn't overwhelmed as it is currently and people get the care that they need in a swift fashion and this doesn't happen again? Yeah, so I'm not going to accept that the system is overwhelmed. What I'm going to accept is we've got some examples where things have not gone the way that we would like them to go. We have a process of continuous improvement, so there is conversations between the Ministry of Health, mm -hmm. the District Health Boards and the Public Health Units. We do need to be involving more people from the community to be able to make sure we get the appropriate support alongside people, and Ministers have been working and talking with officials at every level to be able to make sure that the system operates as we intend it to. Dr McElnay, do you want to... Um, no, to that, that, that's, um, there are uh, constant meetings um, with uh, Auckland District Health Boards um, who are setting up this, um, this system to make sure that we learn from any of these um, events that have happened and make sure that we're providing that level of care. So how do you think that that family feels hearing you say, don't leave it to chance, when they're saying that they made multiple attempts to get in touch with health professionals and were told that these were normal symptoms of COVID? Well, I'm aware that in that particular situation there is a, an investigation underway to find out exactly um, what did occur. But I have spoken to the, the providers that we use for the daily, uh, daily checks that are made to cases currently in the community. And they've assured me that they do ring daily. They go through a number of questions, specifically asking for symptoms and um, offering um, additional health professional um, support if needed. And that's the, the system that we've got. So I, I, I don't, can't go into the details of this particular situation, but it is, it is Robert, a just, just hang on a minute, we'll, uh, we'll take Barry, because I said I would, and then I'll come back down, Craig. Are you aware of the Auditor General's uh, report, John Ryan, into the procurement procedures uh, for saliva testing, and that the uh, panel four on the panel had conflicts of interest? What's going to be done about that? Well, I'm certainly aware of the report, and obviously the Ministry of Health is, is the agency that has been looked into there. They accept the findings of the report. Um, I do note and that Mr Ryan said he doesn't feel the need to go further, but he has highlighted those issues that have concerned him, particularly around where they can improve their, their documentation, their communication, and, and the way in which they worked through uh, the, the RFP. Uh, I would note the Ministry was acting uh, quickly uh, at the time. They were trying to make sure that they dealt with a number of uncertainties in the process, recognising the importance of that development. And I'm very confident the Minister, Ministry will now use the recommendations of the Auditor-General to guide their future practice. If Dr McElnay could answer why, how come four people on the selection panel for the company had conflicts of interest. How did that come about? 
Um, I I wasn't involved in any of the processes there, well, but just, to it, just supporting um, what Deputy Prime Minister has said that the the report from the Auditor General has been accepted by the Minister. We'll be um, reviewing and those recommendations and making sure that our systems going forward, how our processes going forward. How, how could that possibly happen? Well, Barry, I don't think I don't think either the, um, Dr. McLeanay or I were involved in the detail of how that panel was appointed. What I would say is, when um, we're in these areas where there is a great deal of technical expertise required, uh, sometimes it isn't. I'm not making a specific comment about this because I wasn't involved, but sometimes when there is uh, this kind of technical specialist area, you have to go looking for people who know about this particular type of testing. Uh, but clearly. Um, when you're doing that, you should be aware of conflicts of interest. We also know that conflicts of interest need to be managed. It doesn't n automatically mean someone can't be involved, but they do need to be managed. So we would expect the Ministry of Health, as we would do in any part of their work, to be aware of conflicts of interest and manage them. I'm sure that will be one of the lessons they will learn from this. Back, Craig. Back, back to on the home isolation system. Uh, early next week, there'll be this massive exodus of people out of MIQ. Are you considering moving away from the default self-isolation and going back to putting people into MIQ at the default? Uh, we continue to put uh, people into MIQ, and those assessments that are done once somebody tests positive for the virus are very much about the suitability of where they are, their own ability to be able to manage and get through. And so if people are in a position now where the assessment is that that is not the case, they go to MIQ. There is room for them to do that in MIQ, uh, and we'll continue to get the balance between what works for people either in the community or at MIQ. Another topic, you mentioned the resurgent payment. Uh, retail reopened in Auckland this week, but we're hearing a lot of shops still remaining quite empty. They're saying they need more support. Is there any further financial support that can be made available, or what's there? What's there? As I said when I made my opening remarks, more than $5.5 billion of economic support has gone out since the 17th of August via both the wage subsidy scheme and the resurgent support payment. As of today, uh, that resurgent support payment has doubled. Um, we are doing our best to support people. Um, there have been a number of different reports about retail. There was certainly quite a, a rush on the first day in certain parts of the retail sector. But equally in others, for instance, the Auckland CBD, it's much harder going because there aren't the people there that would normally be in town. But our schemes are set up so that your decline in revenue is what defines how much assistance you get. That's why what people will be receiving. Mortgage holidays for business owners. I know the, the previous loan deferral scheme uh, wrapped up in March. Right? Yeah, so um, we've maintained pretty constant contact with the banks over the course of this outbreak uh, to monitor the number of hardship type applications that have been uh, put forward. The banks uh, tell us that they're not at the volumes they were last time and that they're being dealt with by banks. And remember, the only reason the government became involved was effectively as an underwriter with a concern that there would be an effect on the overall financial and banking system. There is nothing like that this time, so therefore that really is fundamentally down to an arrangement between those businesses uh, and their banks. Well, Dr. Come Dr. to Henry. Um, can you just say, when, for the advice that is given to um, people who are home isolating, are there red lines and that advice that basically say go to the hospital immediately, don't bother calling Healthline and waiting or waiting for a daily checking call? Uh, in the UK, it seems like if, if, if someone is at home and they start popping up blood, they go to the hospital. There's no waiting mm. around and checking with Healthline who might not be there. Are there those red lines and the advice? Yes, uh, the, the, in the daily calls, that's, uh, not only do they check for symptoms, but every call is finished with, if anything, if you deteriorate, if you become unwell, uh, ring 111, um, seek that urgent help, do not, do not rely or do not wait for the next call, which, could be, which would be the next day. So that advice is given out on those daily calls. Are you confident that that advice is, is, is you know, getting through people, given the several stories of her, particularly this on the hill this morning? about someone who was clearly deteriorating, but did not go to hospital. I think, as uh, Deputy Prime Minister said earlier, um, uh, 
messages can be given, but sometimes that might not be understood or it's not received or um, people may need a different way of communication with them. And that's one of the things that we're looking at as part of the um, extra um, tweaks to the, the system that we've currently got in place. That is the current system at the moment is it's a phone call. Uh, that may not be the, the, the most appropriate method for everyone. And that's where we want to learn how to make that more um, specific to the needs of individuals and their families. Sorry, I'm just Robinson, just one more. You were talking about business support, uh, resurgence payments. There's been quite a lot of that as lockdown in Auckland. There's been no support for renters, despite the fact that last year there was quite a lot of support for renters. Um, Regis United have called for more support. Um, TPK actually also called for more support, um, but were shot down by kind of by HR. Mm -hmm. Hunt. Did you at any point consider helping renters more, and, and why did you choose not to? We kept a very close eye on the experience of all, all New Zealanders through this outbreak, and particularly low-income New Zealanders. Uh, last time when we made the initiatives we did around, you know, uh, around making sure that people's rents couldn't go up and so forth and so on, that was in the environment of extreme uncertainty as to what was happening. In this environment now, um, we can be confident that the systems we've got are the ones that should work. So that is, if people have significant financial stress, there are a number of avenues for them, particularly through the Ministry of Social Development, to be able to, to work on. So no, on this occasion, we didn't take that beyond an ongoing consideration. Minister Woods, as, as Housing Minister, um, keeps us up to date with the situation for Kainga Rotens. I'll come down to Joe, and then I'll come back up the front. <laughs> MSD said they had less support, um, they had less money available for that support than they did last year. So well, well that, that support is made available. If MSD has concerns about the amount they have available, they're fully able to come to us. What do you say to someone who's on the wage subsidy? So they're, they're possibly getting, I mean, I know you encourage employers to pay the full amount, but some people on the wage subsidy are getting 70, 80% of their income, um, and their rent's already taking up 40% of their income, mm. and there's no control that means their landlord can't, at some point, ask for a higher rent. What, what do you say well, bear in mind, again, we changed the rules so rents could only go up once a year um, in between now and last time, and we continue to tell people that if they have concerns about their ability to make ends meet, that they do contact MSD. Joe. Um, you mentioned that one of the six and seven have been vaccinated. Do you know who the person who was vaccinated was the person who had the exemption to travel to Auckland to pick up the family member? I'm not no, aware of that. that. Sorry, Joe. I can find know. that out. So, is there a situation where a vaccinated person has yet again been able to I actually, I, I think that the person, I think I've just, I've got a note here which I just need to check, but I actually think that the person who has left Auckland was the vaccinated person, but I will come back and confirm that. But I mean, on that, and it's come up a lot now, is there still active consideration around people who are getting exemptions to cross that border and come back to other regions? actually requiring vaccination for that sort of movement? It's not something that we've, we've got under active consideration right now. Um, obviously, there are many different reasons for why exceptions might be required. Some of those have to happen at very short notice as well. They're not necessarily things that are planned. So, um, obviously, we want everybody to be vaccinated. The vaccination rates in Auckland are now high, and so we have a limited number of people, uh, but we continue to have to deal with the reasons why people need exemptions, and unfortunately sometimes that means we, we can't intervene. Yeah, so I must ask as well what your um, view is on the merits, I guess, of moving into the traffic light system for the whole country earlier to use it as a way to sort of nudge the unvaccinated across the line who are living a pretty comfy level too. Yeah, I don't have a lot to add to what the Prime Minister said to you, Joe. Um, you won't be surprised to learn that. Um, obviously, you know, we want to create an environment where not only are we all moving forward with vaccination, but there are reasons why the unvaccinated um, should get vaccinated. I'd say today that there are many reasons for that, regardless of what we end up doing with the traffic light system. In particular, in the very near future, regardless of exactly when that is, if you want to be going to the gym or going to bars, you're highly likely to be being asked for a vaccine certificate. So those reasons exist. Just this week, Air New Zealand have given their announcement about flying. Um, we need people to understand that whenever we go into that traffic light framework, it will be different if you're vaccinated or not vaccinated. And those incentives exist today. But obviously, as the Prime Minister has said to you, we do have the option at the back of our mind to be able to change where we were. Is it that you would see Auckland moving into it first to kind of get it in and then moving the rest of the country 
succulent after that. And, and is it likely to be before Christmas so that everyone is on the same page and part of that system before Christmas? I think the Prime Minister indicated to you in the interview that that's what we're working on right now. We still have the target of people reaching 90% in each DHB, and we are moving forward and we're getting to closer to that. But obviously we've also got to bear in mind the other commitment that we've made, which is that we will have Aucklanders being able to travel for Christmas. In order to put those two things together, uh, we have to look at what the best arrangements are in terms of the traffic light framework and what we require of people. Those decisions will be made soon. <laughs> Hang on, we'll just, we'll just bring it down. We've got some time, although I would indicate that we won't go quite as long today as I did last week. So I'll take people who haven't asked. We'll come to Jason and then back. Uh, so can you, if Jen has got a supplement. On that. Okay. Um, so for Auckland to be able to move at Christmas, the whole country needs to be in the traffic light? Uh, that, I mean, we're, we're, that's what we're working through. I'm just processing that question. That's, that's what we're working through at the moment. Obviously, Aucklanders, we've made the commitment that Aucklanders will be able to leave. We have to have a system that can support and back that up. Um, the vaccination order originally excluded family carers providing care and support in the home from the definition of care and support workers. The latest amendment to the order has removed that exclusion. Can you explain? Um, can you explain explain the basis for that requirement? For example, a father who provided care to his children and um, in their own home. Do you have anything on that, Dr. McInerney? <laughs> not not specifically on that. Um, no, sorry. I think my understanding, Jason, I, I can come back to you on the specifics of the order. But my understanding is that, in looking across the broader healthcare sector, we wanted to a to provide some consistency but B, to make sure that if there were people in vulnerable situations that they were protected. Um, it is uh, a challenging area because there are a lot of different arrangements in community and home care. You, you've given one of those where it's a parent, but there are also caregivers that are coming in and out of people's houses as well. So we have set the net relatively wide here to make sure that we are protecting um, as many people as we can, no matter what healthcare setting that they're in. Yeah, Dr. Dr. McElnay, just really quick, it might be a bit of a technical one, but um, I, you, you said that there were 80-something, I can't remember the exact number, people in hospital. Are you able to tell us how many people have got their single uh, first jab and a second out of the, that number? Um, I don't have that split down, but we do provide details um, on our website of vaccination status, and that's updated... I think it's updated on a weekly basis. I think um, I can do it. Can you? That's <laughs> Here great. you go. So, Jason, you're asking about the 81 today. That's correct. Of those, um, fifth, you want to know, so how many of them were fully vaccinated? Um, five. Um, one who was fully vaccinated but second dose was less than 14 days. One. One who had uh, 20 who had received no, one dose and 51 who had had none. So 51 out of the 81 who had had none. Oh, Sorry, I did say I'd come back up. Just on that, Dr. No. Mayor, can you confirm that um, MedSafe is now considering an application from Pfizer in regards to the vaccine for five to 11 year olds? And when is the soonest children could be vaccinated? Uh, yes, that is my understanding that MedSafe has received that application. I don't have a timeline on. Um, when MedSafe would make that determination, they'll they'll be doing that as they've done with um, with all the other applications um, under um, urgency, um, but, but using their due processes. So we'll be able to update you when that happens. And just bear in mind too that the process that occurs there is then it comes through the technical advisory group as well, right. and then Cabinet makes its decision to use. So there are several steps once the application's been provided. Um, MedSafe also obviously require a significant amount of paperwork. Um, Pfizer's generally speaking been pretty good at providing all of that, but there can be the odd delay um, getting that through. And I think it's really important that we get this right. Um, you know, this is people have, you know, a lot of New Zealanders want their children to be able to get the vaccine, but they also want to know that we've gone through all of the robust steps. So it will take a little bit of time, but this is a milestone in the sense that the um, application has, has been provided. Yeah. Yeah. Just take it for a New Zealand, uh, um, would New Zealand wait to receive child sized vials, or would um, could we uh, dilute the adult vials and so in that way we could get started sooner? My understanding is that it's a, it's a different preparation, so it's not something that you can take the adult um, vial and uh, use less of. It's actually a specific paediatric formulation, but obviously that's what we will um, await MedSafe's view on um, 
on that. I'm just con- by the way, I'm just conscious of our time here because both Dr. McElnay and I have a meeting um, that we need to get to for two o'clock. So I'm going to take people who haven't asked a question yet, and I'm going to go to Amelia and then to Mike. Over. Thank you, Dr. McElnay. How can you say that the Auckland healthcare system can cope with these cases when the nursing organisations just put out a statement saying that severe staffing shortages are impacting patient care because they do not have the staff, even if the healthcare system has the beds? Uh, well, I, I base my statement on the conversations that we've had with the district health boards and the, and the chief executives there and the senior managers, and, and that's what they have been uh, telling us with the numbers that we're seeing and what we project um, in, the, in the near term is that um, we do have the capacity. Well, just sorry, no, we're not going to take a different question. I said we'd come over here. Yep. And another legal it's a different question. I said we've got to move around. So, yep. It seems inevitable that um, Māori vaccination rates will probably still not be as desirable um, once the traffic light system kicks in. So has the government reached out to iwi Māori to ask them, uh, to resource them for things, ways to keep their people safe while the country keeps moving? Absolutely, and it's really important to remember that the vaccination campaign doesn't stop when we reach 90% anywhere. Mm. It's vitally important that we continue to see people vaccinated, and especially in groups such as Māori, where the rates are, are, are lower than the nationwide average. The two parts of the $120 million funding that we announced on the 22nd of October, the first half of it was about straight-out vaccination campaigns. The second part of it was specifically designed to do what you're talking about, which is to support not only iwi but other Māori groupings to be able to help us design some of the ways in which we're going to be able to manage the traffic light system. Well, the government support iwi, for instance, putting up a roadblock to stop Aucklanders from going into some areas just because of the vaccination rates? Would that I, be something that mm. they support? That's, that's a discussion that obviously would involve the police significantly, but also we would want to move obviously very carefully if that was a consideration. We've had really good relationships, particularly in the far north, with the, with the iwi groups who've been involved in in the roadblocks there. Uh, we want to make sure that if, if that were to be a consideration, it'd be worked through with everybody. But at this point, no, that's not something we'd be putting money towards. If that's happened and where it has happened, we've seen really good cooperation between the police and those running those checkpoints. I'll just come down the front. Sorry, Amelia, no. Yep, and T- News Hub's had several, and we've only got a limited amount of time, and other agencies have had none. Yes. Uh, yes, there are three who are aged under 12. Um, from the information uh, from this morning, uh, uh, there didn't seem to be any schools that had been identified no. as locations of interest. Obviously, those are the details that we want to go back and, and just check, and we'll be getting further updates this afternoon. But at this point, there's not that I'm aware of there's any locations of interest that are schools. OK, here. Uh, and what's, um, what is the current, or Minister, or Dr McCall, what's the current average... Uh, waiting time or processing time for tests, and what happens if somebody who needs one of those 72-hour free departure tests to leave Auckland doesn't get it before they leave? Because we've heard from uh, people who say it's been 72 hours, they haven't got it back, and I heard from someone else who didn't get their result, and uh, the t- clock was ticking, they went to the testing centre themselves and were told that somebody just forgot to test them. Uh, well, well, obviously, in situations like that, there, there is going to be the odd example of a human error that might cause something like that. The timing, um, the median processing time for swabs arriving at a lab and being reported at the moment is 21 hours. Uh, How far are you with that? Is that a good level? Well, we try to keep it under 24, That's and right. so that That's is, right. that, that right. is um, under the target that we have. Right. Hang on, hang on Janae, and then we'll come up to you, Becca, do another round for anyone who hasn't. Is the government considering um, mandating vaccines for any other types of the workforce? Uh, at this point, we're, we're still working through the process that was outlined a wee while back, which is around the law change that will actually enable people, most employers, to be able to do that themselves. Uh, we're having ongoing conversations with the police um, to work out where they, they sit within that framework. I would note that the police, I think, are now up to close to 90% first dose, so that's been progressing really well. Uh, so those conversations are ongoing. Okay, and just in terms of the Auckland border, can you be any more specific as to when that might open? I don't... It, 
what hap what's happening with the border is still going to be separate to what happens with the movement to the new framework? The Auckland boundary. Sorry, yeah, yeah. yeah. Boundary. So as the Prime Minister indicated, we'll have something to say next week about the date around the Auckland boundary. Uh, it's important for us that we give people plenty of, of warning about that and so therefore they can make their future plans. As we've said before, what happens outside of the Auckland boundary is a factor for us, um, but we'll be making announcements about that next week. Can I ask, can you, can I ask you, you, have you, have you had a discussion with the Prime Minister about her visit to Auckland? Um, I, yes, yes, I have. The, she said she had visited uh, casually hospitality. Um, was that when she went to the Crave uh, Cafe in the morning, or did she do it on a wider basis? Because hospitality in Auckland don't seem to be aware of her talking to anyone. I didn't get into that level of detail with her, Barry. Sorry. Can we come back to Jess? Because we haven't been back there and then down. Dr. Mathano, with the um, 11 cases in ICU, how much fat is there with ICU beds in Auckland at the moment? Um, I do have those details. Um, but I mean, certainly I uh, ICU is one of the ones where um, there, 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 is capa there is capacity, and certainly in terms of the ventilators in ICUs, there's um, significant capacity at So ICU moment. occupancy um, is around 70% at the moment, so there is room. And as Dr McElnay said in her opening comments, the thing you have to remember about ICU capacity is it changes every day. So whilst we have COVID and we're concerned about COVID patients in ICU, there are other reasons that people come mm. in and out of ICU. Sure. But we yeah. are confident about the capacity yeah. there. Point of clarification, with those six Stratford cases, one's vaccinated. Are any of the others under 12, or is it five eligible people who are not vaccinated? No, there are three people who are not eligible to be vaccinated, three children who are not eligible to be vaccinated. Minister, what I said I'd come question. here. Thank yep. you. Um, um, so just on home isolation, so in light of um, concerns from the nurses' union, so they've said as well that community nurses are so under pressure in Auckland, they're worried that, you know, that home isolation is growing at a, at a rate that they can't keep up with and that it's going to potentially lead to more deaths. Can you give a sense of how under pressure the system is at the moment with sort of nearly 3,000 people in isolating at home and yet how much headroom there well, is? Again, to reiterate what Dr McElnay has already said, we, we have a conversation every single day about how the outbreak's been managed and one of the things we talk about every single day is the capacity of the system to be able to do that. Workforce is clearly a really critical part of that and the assurances that we've been given by the district health boards is that they are able to manage. Of course, when something like COVID comes along, it puts additional pressure on the system and on workforce. Throughout this outbreak, we've had people from other parts of New Zealand come in and support in Auckland, and we continue to look at how we can move workforce around. I am not underestimating the pressure that the health workforce in New Zealand has been under, in particular our nursing workforce, and they have done a magnificent job, and we continue to work with them to be able to make sure that we can support them. But the information we have that we request on a daily basis is that the system can cope. Why isn't the Ministry recording the number of pregnant people who... Um, oh, why isn't the Ministry recording the number of pregnant people getting vaccinated when we know that they're at a higher risk uh, from COVID and the College of Midwives has said that that data would help target vaccine campaigns, campaigns and care planning? I don't have any information yes, I, I, we'll, um, I couldn't see who asked that question. Sorry. Um, we'll, I'll follow that up for you because I, I think the issue there is that, that in, we would need to have that information collected. And once it's on our um, database, then that is something that you can, in theory, um, you can produce. Um, but it's um, only a moment in time. Uh, you you get I, numbers rather than yeah. percentages. What I would say is that in terms of risk assessments, when people either present at hospital or whether they're coming through the system, the testing system, and now through the, the home and community isolation system. These are the kinds of assessments that are done. And so while that data is not routinely collated, it is one of the questions that will be being asked about where people are in terms of their health vulnerabilities or their health risks. I'm just going to take a few more, so I'll do Craig, and yes, I will come back. Just a very quick question on behalf of a colleague. Um, Christmas is fast approaching. So I've heard. I wonder whether a space has been set aside for Santa Claus in my queue, or whether he has an exemption. We're getting in early with that question, Craig, but um, suffice to say that, uh, as we've done in the past with the Easter Bunny as well, I'm quite confident that Santa will be able 
uh, to make his presence mm. felt. Since he's fully vaccinated, will he, will he have a better chance of um, getting an exemption? <coughs> Absolutely. I'm pretty confident that Centre will be fully vaccinated, understanding the importance of vaccination uh, for everybody. Given, given that's right. Isn't he? We would can, want you to just, can you stop destroying people's myths here, Craig? Back over to Amelia. Thank you. As Minister for Sport, you said you'd look at reopening pools under strict guidelines, but yet you've ignored all attempts from the swimming community. How come? I actually, if I recall, that, that question actually went to Dr McElnay in terms of the way that the Ministry of Health would look at that. So I, I, I personally wasn't making that commitment. I don't know if the Ministry of Health looked at that. I'm not aware that actually we've, we've been asked from a public health perspective to provide our advice on that. that are you specifically talking about we Auckland? We asked you last Auckland. week about yes. reconsidering polls. That's right. And um, I have said you that, reconsidered it? I said that if we were asked to reconsider it, we would, and I'm not aware that we have been asked to reconsider it. Because Come down to... You haven't it's you not come through me either. So, so who, who would be reconsidering it? Who do you need to be asked by to reconsider it? Um, that would probably come through Sport New Zealand or through an application that would come through um, DPMC would be the way that would happen. Sorry, Amelia. Challenge. Down another to Jim because I've got to finish. Yeah. Um, so coming back to the Auditor General, uh, mm -hmm. the government spends $55 billion a year on procurement. It's a third of your budget. What are your expectations about how conflicts of interest should be managed? Oh, well, they need to be managed in the same way that they are in any part of what the government does. They should be identified early by people. Uh, an assessment is made as to whether or not they can be mitigated against, because as I said before, just because you have a conflict of interest doesn't mean you have to completely remove yourself. You may, for example, remove yourself from one part of a process where you have a conflict, uh, and so we would expect that. Where those conflicts can't be managed, then alternative people should be able to be brought in. What about disclosure? I mean, it, it took a lot of effort to find out who was on these selection, selection panels and who's advising them and, and what their conflicts are. Shouldn't all that be out in the public um, for the participants to see and to put reassurance that it's going to be kosher? Yeah, I, I guess we try to release as much information as we can. When it comes more generically to appointments, often that is very personal information. And so we do have to sometimes be a little bit judicious about the way in which personal information relating to appointments comes. But as a matter of practice, we should be releasing as much information as is as, as appropriate under the OIA. OK, folks. Oh, sorry, Jenna, we'll just take what you and then we'll finish. Yeah, what is the government's message to groups still trying to get out of being vaccinated? Obviously, another legal challenge of the vaccine, vaccine mandate has been rejected by the High Court. So what's your message to those trying to get out of their mandate? My message is that we need the maximum number of New Zealanders to be vaccinated. And as I said in my opening remarks today, we haven't taken decisions about mandating lightly. We've looked carefully at the areas where we know we need to protect the vulnerable, those who can't get vaccinated, and make sure that everybody feels safe in those settings. My message is the vaccine we've got is safe. It's a vaccine that's been used all around the world, and we know from the data and statistics we've, we've got in our own outbreak, it has a demonstrable role in making sure you don't get as sick, that you are less likely to pass on the virus to others. So I really just ask and urge people to think of those in the communities that they work in and get vaccinated. Is the message of not being able to give the country more certainty as events start cancelling in the lead up to Christmas? Look, we are moving to give as much certainty as we possibly can. We obviously announced during the week the, the uh, underwrite scheme for the larger events, uh, and we are providing uh, the information as soon as we get it. As we've said before, with COVID, there are no easy decisions. There are no decisions that you can make with all the information, but we will continue to move forward in a careful and a balanced way. Thanks, everyone.